would like to begin with uh, welcoming uh, Felix Rösch, especially for participating in this conversation on his uh, recently published article in Cooperation and Conflict, uh, which is entitled Affect, Practice and Change, Dancing World Politics at the Congress of, of Vienna. Uh, and Felix is uh, an associate professor at uh, Coventry University. I would also like to welcome uh, uh, Maria Melkso, uh, who's a senior lecturer at the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, school, Brussels School of International Studies, I know this, this at the University of Kent. Um, we're very grateful that you have accepted to uh, participate in this discussion of Felix's article. And um, secondly, I would like to also uh, say welcome to Linda Ohel, uh, who's a senior lecturer at Gothenburg University. And I would also like to thank you very much for, for having said yes to participate in, in today's conversation, which I very much look forward to. Um, so what we first of all will do is that I will ask uh, Felix, two questions. Um, and the first question I would like to ask, and my own name is Ted Svensson, and I'm one of the editors uh, of Cooperation and Conflict. And the first question I would like to, to ask you, Felix, is um, what is the intellectual trajectory, your personal intellectual trajectory that led you to write this specific article? And also, secondly, what are, what are your own thoughts on its main contribution and um, and the main argument that you, you provide readers with. So if we could maybe start in that end with you speaking to these two questions, and then we will move on to other comments and questions that we, we have later on. So please feel free to begin. Okay. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Ted, for the invitation. Um, thank you also for accepting the paper for publication. <laughs> um, and thank you for Linda and Maria for, for joining this debate, I'm very glad. Um, that in this way we can connect and reconnect. Um, what I wanted to engage and dis discuss in this paper are um, primarily two things. Um, the very first of it is I wanted to bring um, emotions into conversation with the study of practices um, because so far in practice theory, I, I, I didn't see a lot of engagement with uh, the questions of emotions in it and to a certain extent it has surprised me because whenever you engage in a practice so that means you engage with other people there are some emotions they may be good or bad and they may and they have an impact in how you engage in this practice and how this uh, practice evolves so that was my main aim the second one um, that i wanted to do was to further um, the study of dance in international relations <clears throat> Because again, there is relatively little um, in international relations, which to a certain extent, when I first engaged in, in considering dance for international relations, quite surprised me because we have um, a substantial contribution from, from colleagues working in, in art and aesthetics and popular culture. And I was surprised to see that there's relatively little about this, maybe most ubiquitous um, cultural practice on earth, because I, I, I can't, I don't know of any community that doesn't engage in, in dance one way or another. So I was relatively surprised that we in international relations didn't consider that further yet. So, so in, in this sense, it was a second aim of this paper to, to further stimulate interest in this regard. Um, that led me to, um, to, to work on, on, on this paper. Um, I must admit my, um, my general approach to um, to research is more inductively than deductively. So I started off with being interested in dance and the Congress of Vienna. And then I asked myself, okay, what can I learn from it in terms of, uh, does it have any, any relations in terms of world politics? Um, so this is how I proceeded. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Felix, for, this, uh, for these introductory thoughts um, on your article. Um, should we directly move on to uh, uh, Maria, maybe you asking some of your questions or raising some of your comments? Happy to, and thank you for the invitation and thank you Felix for this uh, really uh, exciting, excellent article, which of course also sort of continues on what you have written 
uh, about before dance as a as a you know unusual practice in teaching but also builds a bridge with uh, linda's earlier article also published in cooperation and conflict now linda uses dance uh, as a metaphor if i if i remember correctly and your article is is really about the changing practice of dance as a reflector of of changing political vision of the world uh, against the backdrop of the congress of vienna um, now this metaphorical side of dance, of course, uh, is something that very often is, is used to describe the performativity of diplomacy. And it, it immediately reminded me, your piece also, even though you don't use dance metaphorically, reminded me of an Estonian novel uh, by, by uh, one famous Estonian novelist, Mikkel Mutt called Rahusvalinen Mees, or the International Man, which is set against the early 1990s, uh, when the first post-communist foreign minister and the later president of Estonia, Lennart Meri, was building up the new Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the soon-to-be, again, independent Estonia. And, and this, this writer describes the moves, the diplomatic efforts of this, this uh, foreign minister character precisely via the metaphor of dance. So the late motif in the book is Rudolfo. This is the, you know, the, the, the pseudonym for, for the character, dances. <laughs> but your take on dance is emphatically effective and bodily. Um, and, and for those of you who haven't yet read uh, this, this fascinating piece, it would be uh, obviously interesting to know how exactly do you see effect traveling via dance? What happens in this world political dances that you describe? And, and thereby also, what is then the diplomatic power of dance? Yeah, thank you, Maria. Um, so I have another novel to read. I hope there's an English or German translation of it. Um, I have to check afterwards. Not sure. um, you're quite right. I, my interest in in dance started from um, from using it pedagogically. Um, so so what I do with my students is uh, is I, I try to dance power um, because I want to help them understand that uh, there are different conceptualizations of power and the whole uh, and depending on what kind of conceptualization you use or the way you understand power, you, it also has quite a large impact on how you see the world and how you engage with the world. So normally when I ask my students what they understand or like how do they define power, they would normally define it something similar that Max Weber had in mind, you know, in the sense that you have the ability to dom dominate someone else. And of course that's, that's a valid um, definition. But then there are also other definitions of power, you know, something more in line, for example, like Hannah Arendt in the sense of you have to act together and that, you know, creates power only if you work together. So what I um, what I do in these workshops is I, I collaborate with uh, colleagues in our dance research institute, um, and we use modern dance forms. We use these modern dance forms because they are different than standard ball ballrooms in the sense that um, it doesn't matter, for example, if you dance if men or women dance together, or um, you know gender doesn't matter, age doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are a small person, if you're a tall person, because um, the dance that we use is contact improvisation. And if you don't know contact improvisation, it's, it's somewhat similar to capoeira maybe, right? So it's, 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 it's movements that only work together in collectivity. Um, and you have to start feeling the other. Because simply put, if you push too much or if you push too little, all of you will be on the floor, right? And then it doesn't work. Um, and this is so, so I want to teach my students, you know, um, these different conceptualizations of power. That was my starting point. Um, and then I got interested in, um, through my uh, research, um, because there's a lot of dance studies about uh, the use of dance for peace building, conflict resolution. Um, and I didn't see much of it in international relations. So then this got me then interested in um, the case study, for example, here in the, the Congress of Vienna, but I'm currently also looking at other cases in the 19th century where they use dance um, in a way, um, not necessarily consciously for conflict resolution, but it played a, a huge part. And the Congress of Vienna is particularly famous for it because there's this, there's this famous Beaumont by Charles Joseph de Ligny in the sense that um, the Congress dances, but it doesn't move forward, right? So this, this got me interested. And what I then realized is that we that it was in terms of dance um, 
a very quintessential moment because what we see here is a transition in the beginning of the 19th century from um, these former dances like the minuet where you uh, were dancing together in groups but not um, there was very little physical contact right and with the walls that we see a transition to the standard ballroom dances that we know today right um, where you have one um, single partner and um, you dance with that partner throughout the dance. And what I try to argue in, in, uh, in this paper is that this is a practice, an everyday practice that contributed to change the perception of how we see the world. Um, and this, this happened through um, um, the practice itself, but also what the practice um, encapsulated. And this is an argument that has been done before. So this in and through uh, by, for example, Vincent Puyot, um, Emmanuel Adler, Sebastian Schindler. Um, but I focus here on, on, on the question of fact. So what we, um, the, the changes in meant that we see changes um, in the practice for the simple fact that it's um, spatial temporally conditioned. So even if the same people would dance, you can never replicate the same dance twice, right? Because you're in a different setting, uh, your bodies might have aged, uh, it's a different time, the weather is different, etc. The audience might be different. But it also allows you to, um, to imagine the world in a sense, and, and uh, what I try to argue for is that the, that the emotion that it creates in between the dan dances uh, creates certain potentialities, but also it leaves room for changing the, the, the perceptions that you have. Um, and that's where I picked these two dances, the minuet and the waltz. And admittedly, both dances were not the most important dances in, um, in, uh, at the Congress of Vienna. The most famous one was probably the Polonaise. Um, because, on, because the minuet was already on, on decline. And the, the minuet was a dance that allowed the rulers to um, basically perform their, um, their ability to govern, their ability to rule, um, because there was, there was a very strict order, right? So for example, when um, just the entering of the ball, um, uh, of like the, the ballroom or the floor, there was an order. So in, at the Congress of Vienna, the very first one to enter would always be the, the Russian Tsar, because he was the highest ranking European uh, noble person. And he was uh, accompanied by the Austrian Empress, because she was the wife of the host, so to speak. Second would be the Austrian Emperor, um, um, emperor with the Russian Tsarina, and then followed by other people. And depending, basically, when you enter the dance floor, that already would indicate where do you stand in this European circle of nobility, in this um, um, in this elite. And you would also send out a message to bystanders, to the audience, to say that we have the right to govern. Right? So it's not only the dancing per se, but also the entire setting. Um, to to um, give you an example, there was the opening ball. Um, I've read that there were up to 16,000 candles lit right, um, to illuminate the night. And that must have been an awe-inspiring image for the, uh, for the, uh, for the Vienna, Viennese population. Um, and to give you another example, I'm currently working on a, a dance hall in late 19th century Japan. Um, and this, this dance hall in late 19th century Japan was the very first one with electric light. So that was the very first electric light that Japanese could see. So it's the entire setting that, that is important. With, with the walls, then we see a transition because not only do you have one single dance partner, so you're not anymore trying to, um, to recreate a hierarchy but it's, it's more, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's also more individual because you can make, uh, you know, you can vary the, um, the movements. Um, and it was also more, an, I'm not entirely sure if there was waltz danced um, actually at an official occasion at the Congress of Vienna. I do have, um, there are two later recollections who claim that, but I'm not entirely sure if that was the case. I think it they were more danced in, in these salons. And these salons were um, organized um, by women uh, and brought together um, national groups, 
right? So, so I think the setting in the salon to which dancing contributed and the walls helped them to, um, to develop national sentiments, right? Moving away from this idea of a transcultural uh, European elite more towards a national setting, right? And ironically, later on, the walls um, was also um, dismissed as non-national enough because it was then perceived to be more like a, um, an Austrian dance. So we have then um, um, national movements in Eastern Europe, for example, who then um, considered um, their own national dances. Um, so in, in Hungary, for example, um, you had then, the, um, I think it was called Tsardas, uh, which, is, which was considered to be more appropriate for the, for the Hungarian context. Yeah, so that's that's kind of like the backstory of um, of um, uh, of my paper. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. Uh, maybe this is a good point to bring in Linda uh, to also raise a few uh, points in relation to your your text. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks for this invitation, and um, and uh, thank you, Felix, for a great article and I'm you know I, I've used dance as a metaphor myself um, and I'm super uh, yeah I don't know I for me I think when I when I started thinking about dance to explain um, militarization uh, to begin with it was just I don't know it was like I saw dance everywhere when I was thinking about IR and you know why why are we not using this and and uh, that's why I think this Otko is really, you know, arguing that, you know, we need to consider the politics of dance in, in IR much more uh, widely. And, 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 and so I'm very much interested in, in dance as an analytic and then also how it might be this transformative um, process um, that potentially has this, you know, potential for peace or how, however we, what peace might be. But um, so, it, Felix, what 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 is the future for dance in IR? You know, what what kind of analysis can dance help us do? Uh, you think, both as a as a practice and historical examples, and, and you mentioned some um, some more details about dance now. But yeah, more broadly, what what can what can dance help us do? It it can. Um... I think what I um, what I learned through engaging with um, you know dance at the Congress of Vienna, which in the 19th century, obviously, I did ask myself to a certain extent: Is this just historically interesting, or does it have any implications for the 21st century potentially as well? And I think for us as scholars, it it just highlights that we should consider more these everyday practices that we may not actually perceive as related to politics at all. It, you know, just something nice and interesting. I mean, and at the Congress of Vienna, they, they, it wasn't only what dancing that they were doing, that there were also other forms of social gatherings. There were sleigh rides in winter, etc. And I think we, maybe because this is how we are, how we are trained, consider more what happens officially in, in, in boardrooms behind closed doors. But I think it's, it's more often the important bit is what happens outside of these boardrooms. And I can give you another example. Um, what I normally do with my students is, is um, I like to take them to the theater, um, partly because a, a lot of my students never had the opportunity to go to a theater before and, and I like to experience them. And one year we, um, um, I took them to a play called Oslo. Um, it was quite popular a couple of years ago. I, I don't know if you had the opportunity to see it, but it's basically uh, it's based on the um, on the um, uh, what then led to the um, the Dayton Accords. So it's the the uh, cooperation between um, Palestine and Israel. So early 1990s, mid 1990s. So there was a, a moment of well hope that they could settle a peace. Um, and it's based on the um, on the work done by these Norwegian diplomats, Mona Juul and Terje Rod Larsen, bringing the representative from Israel and Palestine together outside of Oslo, so that it could work together and find a peace. And what this 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 theater play showed is, and I, I like to think there's a, um, um, it you know it's based on on the real life accounts of these diplomats. What it showed was that they started to cooperate 
not what they've done inside the boardroom, but they started to realize that there's a lot that separates them, but there's also something that unites them. And they learned that through everyday practices, through the food they had, through walk through the forest, through um, drinking together, through um, you know just being on on um, personal terms. And I think this is what uh, this is the one thing that we can learn by you know studying such things as um, as you know dance, but it could also be you know um, um, other everyday practices. The the other more immediate impact that I think. Um, and that's what I've learned from, because there's a lot of work done in, in dance studies, is that it does actually have an impact on uh, conflict re resolution. And you, we do have a couple of colleagues like Susanna Hast, like Naomi had in international relations who have argued for that. Um, so to give you another example, when I, when I um, did my research for, um, for the pedagogical paper, I um, came across work from colleagues in South Korea, who used contact improvisation, this modern dance form, to bring together refugees from North Korea and South Korea and, and the local community in South Korea to rebuild connections. So they use specifically dance in order to develop common, you know, um, Lily Ling called this a common emotional world, right? To, to, to rebuild a connection. Um, and I think this is something that, 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 I think we could further explore in international relations to what extent we can use a f an, an everyday practice like dance because it's such an ubiquitous practice. You know, whatever culture we are in, we find dances and um, to, to bring communities back together again on a, on a very, obviously on a very local level. But I think, you know, this is how you should, um, where you should start. So I think there is actually a lot of opportunity in terms of, considering dance for international relations on, on, on a variety of levels, um, very practically for, for conflict resolution, but also just to remind ourselves that we might want to shift our focus a little bit. I don't want to, you know, I don't dismiss that obviously what happening in boardroom and meeting rooms is important, right? That, that the signing of treaties is important. This is stuff that we have to study, but that's not the end of the story. And that's maybe just the beginning or maybe just the end. But there's, there's a whole lot of other things um, outside of it that we want to consider. So, yeah, I hope that, yeah. Thank you, Felix. Uh, Lynn, I don't know if you would like to follow up anything in relation to, to, to dance specifically, but I also know from previous correspondence that, uh, that both Lynn and Maria, that you have questions relating to emotions, effects, senses, and, um, and also there may be uh, some reflections on uh, where gender might enter uh, the picture drawn in, in Felix's uh, article. So feel free to, uh, I mean, any one of you uh, continue. Should so I? Um, yeah, I mean, and it's something I've been thinking about myself as well. Um, but uh, reading um, the article, and you talked about it um, just um, earlier as well, but how, um, yeah, so there seems to be layers of gender. Um, my gender interest is sparked in numerous ways, but you know, one is just a classical Cynthia Enlow question, where are the women? Uh, and you mentioned, uh, you name um, um, three particular women who were uh, organizing these salons. And, but then I was also thinking about so yeah, so I'm wondering where women are and also this, this transition um, from the minuet to the waltz and how I'm, I'm assuming, you know, waltz, the minuet had less physical contact and then the waltz is more of a heteronormative um, social dance. And so, yeah, what role were women playing in this potential, you know, political transformation? Um, and yeah, I think that was the question. One question. Yeah, um, I'm quite glad about this question. Um, and simply put, they were quintessential. Um, um, yeah, they were, uh, they were central to what happened in uh, the Congress of Vienna because they were organizing these salons. So they were in charge of inviting to people of, um, you know, 
using their own private settings for it to open them up, to invite the, um, to, to choose the food, to uh, choose the kind of music and invite the kind of musicians. Um, so they carefully brought together the people that they wanted to talk to each other. Um, so there's this, uh, there's this nice quote by um, Karl Farnhagen von Ense, who said that the evenings united what the days separated, something in that direction. Um, and for that, for that, the women were quintessential. So they stirred very much the kind of debates that took place um, by bringing the people together and allowing them to, um, um, to, to develop empathy for each other by learning um, about each other and getting to know each other better. Um, you also mentioned the, it's true that these ballroom dances like walls, you know, question of heteronormativity, et cetera. But on the other hand, I also like to see it as a form of empowerment in the sense that, um, you know, you know, we're no longer stuck in a rigid uh, order, how you're supposed to dance and with whom you're supposed to dance, but you had more freedom and more choices, partly also because um, it, it, it was a private setting, these salons, right? If the audience was not like in a ball, uh, a large audience and potentially even, um, you know, Viennese population, but there was a very limited amount of people who were, um, um, were invited. And you could also then be more free and, 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 and dance with people you wanted to dance, right? It gave you opportunities that, that um, in the early times you didn't have. Um, and that brought me also come back to your earlier question about, you know, what dance uh, today. Um, that's kind of the, the fear that I have for today because we live in a different world now, right? We live in a world with social media and everything you do is, will be posted on Twitter, Instagram and um, all the other apps that I don't know. Um, obviously back then, what, whatever happened in the salon stayed in the salons among these people. So, so you, it allowed you to be more free and to, be, um, to maybe act the way you wanted to do and also maybe say what you wanted to. And I think um, today in the 21st century, it is slightly different, but just, um, but yeah, just, I mean, generally, basically, um, I, I don't say that was an intention of mine because I, I'm, um, it wasn't a major intention of mine, but by mentioning particularly, you know, um, women like Wilhelmine von Sagan, Katrin Bagration, I did want to make the point that the role of women was quintessential and I hope you know when we consider such everyday practices we move away from just looking at the people in suits but also consider the other ones that we normally just consider as you know as, as a bystander or not at all maybe um, and I think the Congress of Vienna is particularly a good example which just shows very vividly how important women were and and how powerful they were as well maybe not officially but simply by bringing people together by overseeing that, by stirring the conversations, they could move in the direction they intended to. Um, so they were quintessential, absolutely. Um, and I think in this sense, um, you know, Klenda Sluga did great work um, considering the work of women in diplomacy also in the 19th century, particularly also here in the Congress of Vienna. Uh, Linda, would you like to respond to that briefly or before we reinvite uh, Maria to, to the discussion? No, but I mean, that's what I was thinking when reading um, the article that, you know, by focusing on the everyday and affective practices, you can't really ignore gender or you can't ignore um, the, so it's a way, I, you know, in this example, then a way of um, uh, making visible um, the role women were playing. Absolutely. I think the, you know, focusing on everyday practices does open up the, the, um, our perspective of actors and agency, right? So we're not only considering the official people anymore, but also other people. Um, and also even beyond humans, right? So we, can, we do start consider settings, um, what role do they play? Um, I, mean, I mean, I mentioned earlier, you know, lighting up of 16,000 candles back then, early 19th century, they must have been very, very impressive or inspiring. And also, you know, you have an emotional reaction towards it. Uh, so Maria, uh... yeah, I, I, I sort of 
continue, if I may, uh, with this uh, important intervention, I think, uh, that you make uh, in connection to how thinking happens and how do we actually sort of uh, start to learn to think in a different way and how, how this you know precognitive preconscious unconscious uh, unreflective actually are shaped by the very practice by the very practice of uh, co-being and co-mingling co in that sense uh, you talk about thinking in motion you know we have previously discussed how this uh, also very much sort of resonates with uh, Eric Ringmar's notion of, of carnal knowledge and how, how different kind of knowledge is actually gained via this bodily experience of, of uh, you know, getting to know yourself, but also getting to know the others and how you can, you can do something together. And I think obviously the broader message, something that you have already also iterated, uh, I think today is that we have to somehow be more uh, attentive to the senses and how the senses actually matter uh, in our political action and 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 how they uh, you know also matter for for a better understanding of politics you know the the, the old sort of uh, programmatic uh, gist of the uh, aesthetic turn that we have to learn to write and 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 he hear and see and sense uh, politics differently um, how can we take this further from dance um, and, and what could be the further avenues uh, to sort of expand the, the sort of all sensory regimes for, for understanding and, and studying politics in your assessment? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question and I'm not entirely sure if I will have a satisfying answer to it um, because I'm I would say I'm, I'm on the search myself. Um, this is why I, I got interested in the study of um, practices and emotion in the first place, because I do feel it does provide me with a more comprehensive picture. Um, and this is why I said I, I proceed inductively in most of the times in my research, because I, um, from such singular events like the Congress of Vienna, I, I think I then, if I focus on something like that, I, I, I am able to develop a more comprehensive picture as if I would proceed deductively. And I think this is, you know, what, I might be wrong here, but this is what I perceive in your own work about, you know, when you work on rituals, on liminal spaces, on, on ontological security, that you might be guided by something similar. Um, at least when I, you know, think about the the paper by Brent Steele and Ty Solomon, this from micro to macro. So I, I thought you you might have some, let's say, similar understandings. In this in this sense, I don't, I don't necessarily want to, you know, fo focus solely on on dance. It is for me one very ubiquitous everyday practice. But I think through other everyday practices through considering them and through considering how they play out in relation to others we, we can maybe get a more comprehensive understanding um if we ever fully get a, a complete one i'm not entirely sure in this respect to be honest but at least this is something that guides my research that i try to be as comprehensive as as I can from a fully fully acknowledging that I come from a very you know from a very specific perspective and you know um, my age gender etc feed my my upbringing feed into the way I see the world obviously um, but what I like about studying you know the question of emotions and the, and the fact is is it, I find it interesting to just to think about further you know how such interaction with others, you know, can lead to the development of empathy, can lead to development of, of trust. Um, and, and I do find it interesting, you know, substantiated by, um, you know, recent neuroscientific research in the sense that we learn that, you know, simply by observing others, we are the same brain regions are, um, are, are activated as if the person, you know, is doing that. So 
you know, simply through this observing and then particularly through engaging with the other, we start to develop this, you know, as I said, what, what Lin Lin called this common emotional world. Um, I think that doesn't really answer your question, but I, it, it hopefully explains where I'm coming from a little bit that I, I do struggle with, um, I, I don't want to dismiss um, deductive approaches, but I do struggle with it because this is not how, how scholarship works for me. I, I do start with an interesting in, in something and, and with a question. And then I try to, to see if I can make sense of what I'm seeing there, what I'm, what I'm um, observing. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so my impression, I think, is that Linda, you might have some, some reflections that, that relate to what has just been, been addressed. Um, some, some things that we, we've corresponded about before. Is there something you would like to say in relation to this? I don't, I'm not pushing you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, what, what does he mean now? Um, no, but just now when you were thinking, I think what I like is the emphasis somewhere as well about how, you know, because in IR we're so focused on language and this, you know, written text or spoken and, and you know, you're saying it at some point how, you know, maybe that's not the most important type of communication and how, you know, like I am have this pet project on horses and affect and stuff. And, you know, so that's, and, and that's what I like about dance as well, how it's, you know, it's silent communication through bodies that is so um, fascinating. Um, but if, um, you know, so, so one thing that I really like as well in the article is this, um, um, in many different places you, you know, you talk about this distinction between individuality and um, the collective or collectivity. Um, and you talk about affect as um, transpersonal and body becoming and as the collective dimension of emotions. So what, you know, I, I just find this key, like how, what does that help us do? Just, yeah, getting rid of that kind of binary between affect and emotion and I don't know, yeah. some collectivity. Um, so the reason why I called it emotions and affect was more um, heuristically in the sense that I just wanted to imply that um, emotions is not only something that happens just within you, but it, it, it plays out and, and it happens in collectivity. Um, so I don't want to see it as a binary, but you know, it happens concomitantly. It's just, I thought for, uh, it's easier to, if I give it two different terms um, so that we don't mix it up. Um, and this is part of the reasons I think why I've, um, why I want to bring in emotions into the study of practice, because at the moment I, um, it, it seems to be more like when we're talking about changes, um, it's more like a rational conscious process. And I think a lot of the practice changes are not necessarily that. It's um, a lot happens unconsciously, partly because through the, um, you know, as I said, through the practice itself, because even though it's repetitive, right, this is, you know, and this, and there might be things that we do constantly, like dance, for example. No dance is the same thing. Even though you dance the same with the same partner, every time it's something new, right? Um, and, and the other reason is that is, I mean, it, what, what you said is, is, is very important that it's not only the language, right? It's, it's the, en the engagement with others and what we start to feel. And this is something that we not necessarily can stir, right? So it happens a lot unconsciously, but it gives us, it, it makes us feel connected to, to, to the other, right? So, um, I think the question of collectivity in this sense is very important. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. So, so one thing I wanted to ask you about myself, um, which connects to uh, what we, Cooperation and Conflict, have published on recently, and uh, it was an issue that Linda contributed to, um, which was devoted to the theme of everyday IR. And I think you've already, to some extent, addressed the issue of where we connect the everyday with you know, something resembling high politics or whatever we wish to call it. But could you maybe speak to this a bit more? How do you view how we connect 
different layers or levels or whatever way we should think about them. Um, what are your thoughts on that, both as they are being expressed in the article itself, but also your more general reflections on this? Yeah. I think in, in, in a way I would like just to stress that um, I don't want to necessarily even distinguish between, you know, high politics and every day, but it's, it's, for me, this is, these are things that go together and that we should um, um, consider. Um, in, in this way, I think international relations is, is actually a very well-suited discipline because it does give you the opportunity to to look into things that normally you would not necessarily consider to be uh, politics, right? Um, and we mentioned before the um, the aesthetic turn and you know the work of Roland Pleika opening up for um, you know popular culture, and I think this is quite important also to tell my students about it, right? Because most of my students start studying international relations because they might like the idea of diplomacy and um, this kind of stuff. But what I try to explain to them is that you know what um, what happens in your everyday life is is very political, and obviously for that feminist scholarship was quintessential, right? Um, so it, it might be that you that you like reading a comic, it might be that you watch a movie um, or go dancing or these kind of things, but it does have political implications because it is embedded in a political context, and you contribute in doing so to this political con um, context. And particularly when you think about something like uh, comics, or so they have a huge impact because. It is often through the, in, in, in your early childhood that you develop your understanding of politics that on how you engage with um, political authorities and institutions. So to give you an example, there was a couple of years ago, uh, a study done by a German colleague about Benjamin Blümchen and Bibi Blocksberg. And I don't know if you grew up with that, probably not, it's very German. Um, it's, um, it's kind of like a comic story it's for boys and girls. So Bibi Blocksberg is a witch, a little witch, and Benjamin Blümchen is a speaking elephant. Um, and I grew up with that. So this is the kind of stuff that I was listening to and reading when I was uh, a little kid. And what he showed is that the politics and political institutions are very badly presented in there. But this might have an impact on these children, how they in later life approach political institutions, because basically the politicians are presented as corrupt there. Right. So, um, so this is what fascinates me, what interests me, just to highlight to my students, but also in terms of my research, that we might not perceive this as political, but it's highly political. And that's why I like to think about, you know, what we do also in our everyday. And I admit, to be honest, I'm more interested in the relations between individuals, not necessarily politicians, um, in everyday life. And how they come to terms with the differences, how to learn to, uh, to accept the differences and don't see that as something separate, separating, but as something that, you know, a, a potential starting point to, to, to unite them, to, to lead to something more peaceful. And um, yeah. Thank you for that response, Felix. Uh, so I think it's soon time to move towards concluding the conversation, but there's still time for one or two more com comments or reflections. If Linda or Maria, if you have any any left. Well, maybe if I may just ask, uh, you mentioned that you are now working uh, on Japan and you have done fascinating work in that regard before. And I see a little daughter also on your shelf, if I'm not mistaken. So, <laughs> so uh, um, one question, of course, that that comes to this um, uh, dance is is also how how universal uh, this this potential for dance as a for instance as a practice for peace and and sort of you know knowing the other and 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 learning to live better with the other actually is uh, even though it's a very ubiquitous practice as i mentioned uh, can we say maybe or can we speculate uh, that uh, cultures that are uh, by now more of the written kind so to speak uh, that are more language centric or logos centric, are they uh, sort of equally uh, reliant uh, on on dance still, uh, or 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 uh, you know how might that vary? Uh, and and relatedly, um, are you then planning to sort of stretch it 
to a larger thing. This is always the sort of question that 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 interests us scholars. Is it is it sort of something that will grow into a book? Yeah, maybe. Um, this is a good question because um, because Congress of Vienna was in 1815. It was the beginning of the 19th century. But then, of course, we had in the 19th century uh, imperialism. We had nationalism. And that had an impact on how dance was perceived. Um, and what I um, this this other case is um, is more towards the end of the 19th century, and that is actually a very good example where um, the dance didn't really work in the attendant way anymore, simply because the political context had changed. Right, so um, it was used by the by the uh, Meiji government. Um, to create an opportunities for Japanese elite to meet um, with um, Western envoys, Western diplomats, Western military officers stationed in Japan. And, and there were these opportunities, but it didn't have the same effect anymore um, because the Japanese were not perceived as equal. Um, so there are, there are written accounts from um, um, from people who were stationed in in Japan, who um, said that something along the line that you know they're dancing well enough to Japanese, but they're still monkeys, and they actually call them monkeys. So it, you know you very much see the racist undertones. So so there are limits to such practices, right? So there's not they're not the you have to consider the wider context. It's not just that you that you set up a dance workshop and then everything is fine, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. You have to consider the wider context. I still think it has the opportunity um, to bring people together, right? But it does not necessarily create a certain outcome. And um, um, this Japanese case definitely shows it. Um, I must admit, that's not actually what I want to argue for in this um, in this paper, but it is the the, um, uh, the information that, that that I gathered. I do I do toy with the idea to create um, more out of it um, because I, I do actually wonder why dance disappeared as as a practice um, in, in in international politics or in politics at large, actually, because it was very common in the 19th century to set up, um, to have occasions where, uh, you know, even high ranking politicians were dancing together. So um, to come back to this Japanese context, the um, um, traditional Japanese dancing was also in a way that you wouldn't touch the other person and there were, um, it was even considered dancing was even considered to be something uh, inappropriate in a way. So during the shogunate times, so until the 1850s, dancing was done sometimes as a form of political protest, as a riot. There was a lot of cross dressing and this kind of things, and the authorities obviously didn't like it, right? So they tried to restrict dancing. What the Japanese then learned, however, from the 1860s onwards, when they met foreigners for the first time, is that they learned that you, you engage in, in dance practices in, at official occasions. But this then disappeared on, um, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And, and this is something that I would like to further explore, actually, you know, what were the specific reasons why, were, why was it that dance that was so common until the 19th century disappeared? So to give you further examples, um, at the um, at the end of the Thirty Years' War, for example, and there's a nice paper by a, um, a German dance scholar, um, and he studied the um, the dance performances by the French delegation. So what the French delegation was actually uh, the head of the French delegation was actually writing a ballet, and it, and the French delegation was performing that in front of the other delegations, and it was a a, a peace ballet. Right, where they wanted to, to, to demonstrate them how they can create peace. And that was considered to be completely normal and appropriate. Um, and also um, something similar happened in, at the Congress of Vienna in, in Metternich's garden. They set up um, um, a dance performance where, where there was a similar thing like at the end of the Thirty Years' War and people 
would participate in that as well. So this is what I want to study further. I don't have a conclusive answer to that, I must admit. But I found it interesting to see that um, such an such an uh, common political practice completely disappeared almost, right? I mean, we would consider it very strange today to see, uh, you know, someone like Angela Merkel and Donald Trump dancing together, right? Um, 150, 200 years ago, that would have been quite normal, right? Um, so then that would interest me to, to think about it further. At the moment, I'm, as I said, I'm, I focus on this, um, um, on this particular Japanese dance hall to, to learn more about the transition um, in, in Meiji Japan, how it became uh, an internationally recognized actor. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. Um, so I suggest that we make use of that forward looking uh, thinking from your side as, uh, as also the end point for today's conversation. Uh, first of all, Felix, I would like to thank you so much for both, you know, submitting the article to Cooperation and Conflict and thinking of, of, of us as a good outlet for this and also for contributing to such a, a rich discussion today. And secondly, I would also like to express my, my gratitude to Maria and Linda for, for, to, for participating in today's conversation. And, uh, and I, at least, I look very much forward to, to the book version, the full length book version of this once it's out. Um, but thanks so much uh, for today. And um, I will now end uh, the recording. Thank you very much from my side too. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you.